Hello, Shay. Hello, Nancy. So, my turn to, uh, I guess, ask the question Oh, this today. is going to be interesting. Yes. So, if you could be any time period, if you could live in any time period. Live in any time period. What time period would you live in? Oh, man. Well, so I've been I've been watching a lot of Westworld recently. Uh. Yeah, and there's something romantic about um, about westerns, and and so I th- I thought maybe like maybe something maybe like living in like I don't know when would that even be like 18, 1900s, 1800s? I don't even know. Yeah, like when, the Wild like, West. I don't even know when the Wild West was. Oh, uh, like, well, I guess around that time. I joke yeah. with my parents that I was named after uh, named after the Western Shane. I wasn't, but they just they just roll with that. So maybe then, but then I also think that like. I really like antibiotics and I just like scratched myself in a nail the other day and I like that I don't have tetanus. <laughs> so I guess that's kind of, that's a non-answer and that's, that's bad for. I anyway. actually hate Western. You that, hate that, that Westerns? That would be like the last place I'd want to be. <laughs> what would yeah. you, what would yours be? I like, I really like medieval stuff, but again, that's a harsh life. <laughs> that's a tough life. What's, what's I the. I think medieval or the seventies. <laughs> 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 why okay why the 70s of any like recent time period i feel like i just would do good in that era it was fun you know i like the music i don't know the music is yeah. why you're gonna yeah, go with the 70s yeah. medieval or 70s anyways okay but well, i have i the reason i'm asking okay. is i did an interview this week where we went back through history a little bit back in time <laughs> Welcome to the American Geophysical Union's podcast about the scientists and the methods behind the science. These are the stories you won't read in the manuscript or hear in a lecture. I'm Shane Hanlon. And I'm Nancy Bompey. And this is Third Pod from the Sun. All right, Nancy. So you're wearing two hats today. What do you uh, What do you got for us? So today I am bringing you an interview I did with Stefan Talka. He's a physical oceanographer and civil engineer at Portland State University, and I actually first met him a few years ago. I did a press release about a study that he published in one of our journals about changes in storm tides in New York City. Hmm. Yeah, so I mean, that's interesting, but really the cool thing was that him and his graduate student went back to find tide gauge data going all the way back to 1844. Yeah, and it was really, it was such an interesting story. They went to the National Archives here and went through (laughs) all this data. It was It's not your normal, uh, I guess, science expedition going through the archives. Yeah, and so I was just so... You know, I thought, just thought it was so cool that we met up with Stefan again recently at our Ocean Sciences meeting in Portland to talk to him a little bit more about what he's been doing since then, because they've been using this idea of going and using historical data, you know, for different places all over the country. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. So it was super cool. So, yeah, we talked about, about the whole process and some of the really interesting stories that they've uncovered in all this old data. One of the things that uh, scientists need are data, and one of the things that we can't do is go back into the past and measure. One of the problems that we have is that we can't go back and see what the climate was like in the 19th century uh, or that the ocean was like with any sort of accuracy. Uh, So one of the things that I've been doing is uh, looking into archives and finding old tide records, so old water level records that were taken 100, 150, almost 200 years ago and reconstructing or digitizing rather those those records and then looking at things like sea level and sea level rise uh, looking at historic storms uh, looking to see whether the tides themselves have changed over time let's talk about that that data that you find right. so where, where do you get that data where do you find it how do you get it <laughs> yeah so it, it, it you almost have to put on a historian's cap in order to find it so you have to look into archives. So I started out going to NOAA and to the National Archives. And more recently, we've looked at libraries or local archives, uh, state archives, Army Corps archives, basically anywhere where old records are being stored. The most interesting place that we've found tied records were the libraries of MIT and the Harvard Business School Library. And that was based off of a tip that I had from a historian that Perhaps the earliest scientific records are not stored in government archives, but are stored in the private papers of engineers or scientists. The way that 
measurements and the science in the U.S. seems to have evolved as similar to how it did in England, where it was first it was hobbyists uh, that would out, would go out and they'd make some measurements. And Thomas Jefferson is a famous example. Mm. And then as the country started industrializing and building things, then the engineers came in, uh, and that was this uh, Laomi Baldwin in Boston. And so that was sort of the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s era. And then the government took over and sort of centralized it and professionalized it and made it more systematic. And so the real good tide measurements and systematic tide measurements start in about the 1850s in the U.S. and was led by a great-grandson of uh, Benjamin Franklin, a sort of an interesting historic sidelight. I got to be honest, when I first heard tide gauges as a shorthand when we were talking about this episode, I was a bit skeptical. I mean, tide gauges. But this is freaking fascinating. I know. I know. <laughs> Who thought tide gauges could be so interesting? Um, but it's really interesting to hear about how these tide gauge readers actually did their work. Everything they had to contend with in this era is just crazy stuff. There were these little cities, uh, not cities, towns. Maybe 1, 1,500 people at most in San Diego and Astoria. San Francisco was bigger. But there, there were basically these outposts of civilization. And before they were even a state here in, in Oregon and in Washington, there were tide measurements that were being made. Hmm. And so some of the problems that they had to deal with are just totally different than, <laughs> than you know, there's um, some of the early hydrographic surveys in the 1850s, sort of up in Puget Sound, there's notes that, well, we tried to survey here, but there were hostile Indians, and so we couldn't. This, uh, this really puts being inconvenienced because of Metro into perspective, huh? I know, right? <laughs> the original measurements, so the really early measurements, they were all by hand. And then at some point in the 1850s, the Coast Survey introduced uh, self-recording tide gauges or automatic gauges. And they basically worked on the principle that they would have a stilling well where there's basically a float that goes up and down in a pipe, uh, kind of like a float in, in the toilet. And that would be connected to a chain, which be, would be connected to a pencil. And that pencil would move up and down on a piece of paper, which at the same time was being moved forward by a, a pulley mechanism that was being driven by a clock. So if a mechanically driven system, but at the same time, you can, when it worked well, you got a continuous measurement mm. of the tide, minute by minute. And those records were then reduced by either the observer or by uh, what were called tidal computers in Washington, D.C. And those were actual people that read that trace on the scroll and turned it into numbers. There was this organization, and in some ways it was really quite modern because there, there was a central headquarters, which was in Washington, D.C., but then they had tide observers all over the U.S., and somehow they had to communicate with them. And the way they did it was through letters. And there's an astonishing amount of letters that went back and forth. So you end up diving into 19th century correspondence and having to read the cursive and sort of almost living their day-to-day -day existence and then you find some treasures after looking through 200 of them. Wait, what What does he mean by treasures? Like, is Nicolas Cage going to pop out at some point? Oh, yeah, just wait. One way I look at the, the wet, on the West Coast, there were three tide gauges and, uh, in San Diego and San Francisco and in Astoria, Oregon. And the Astoria and the San Diego records, it's kind of like a tale of two observers. <laughs> the, the, the observer in Astoria had a lot of rectitude. He wrote very, you know, he, he was always on time. He went out at 6 a.m. and at 6 p.m. every day and checked the gauge, and he did weather measurements three times a day. And if there was just the slightest problem, he was on it, and he apologized for the very slight mistakes that he made. And, uh, and so you really get the feeling, okay, this guy, he was invested in it. The San Diego observer, on the other hand, there are times when it seems like the gauge is running really well, and then sometimes it just isn't. Uh, he'd get letters, why aren't you checking this twice a day? Uh, and they, they would just sort of go on and on like that. Uh, and sometimes there were the, the whole 
Coast Survey even got embroiled in a controversy in which he, well, he was in San Diego, but apparently he had a wife or quote unquote wife in Washington, D.C., <laughs> who he had been giving money, and then he had stopped giving her money. And so the, everybody, there's these letters going transcontinental asking him, why is this happening? <laughs> and, uh, and he wrote back and said, she is not my wife, <laughs> and I was happy to support her, uh, but then she was unfaithful. And so, so these, these sort of, yeah. Um, and that was not the only time that he was embroiled in something. And during the Civil War, he also, there was an anonymous letter that went to the Coast Survey and denounced him. And I didn't see the letter, but I saw the, the consequences of that letter. And so there was some back and forth. And you can imagine there's, yeah, this drama, but it's probably being delayed by two or four mm -hmm. weeks because it has to be sent by steamer uh, across the country. And so in the end, he was denounced and, and he said, well, even though I'm a Democrat and I don't support this presidency, I am a patriot. And... Uh, and so it ended by they made him sign a loyalty oath. Oh, wow. And I have that loyalty oath. And just to be fair, they also made the observer in Astoria sign the loyalty oath, although it was very clear that he was, you know, mm -hmm. loyal. So, yeah, so there's these interesting intersections with real life that are happening. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's sad, like there was an observer in New York where he wrote a letter and apologized that he hadn't been to the gauge for a few days because one of his kids had died. Mm. And in, during the Civil War, there were, there were things that were happening too, like the, the same observer in New York couldn't get out to Governor's Island because there was a quarantine uh, and the army was there and they were wondering, what is this guy doing lurking around our docks, that kind of thing. So, you know, there were, so there are these sort of things that are happening and make you realize, yes, this was a different time and place. But on the other hand, it's also fairly modern in that you had, it's kind of like a corporation or a government agency where you have these far-flung offices and how do you make sure that they're actually doing good work? Mm -hmm. And uh, so they had these modern problems that they were, you know, these letters are sort of like the email of that age and they're, they're trying to you know, do good work. And so there was one uh, observer at, uh, Pultet Harbor in Maine, it's just a little island that was really cold in the winters. And so there were some problems with the gauge at some point. And so they were mad at you know him for that. And uh, he wrote back and said, you do me grave injustice uh, to presume that I was not tending the gauge because it had turned. And then he explained that he had spent every single night at sleeping in the Tide House um, or visiting it multiple times, keeping the fire going so that the, the, the gauge would not freeze up and seize. And so he had been doing that all the time. Yeah, so, that, so you really get a sense for the people that were involved, and you get to know that, okay, well, maybe I shouldn't trust this part of the Charleston record, for example, because the observer, well, there, I, found some, I found some data and not written in the scrawl was, well, this, I don't know how much we should trust this data because the observer seems to be addicted to sleep. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it continued and said, the observer, or Mr. So-and-so, claims to be for the Blaine liquor law, but methinks that his red nose tells otherwise. <laughs> So, so <laughs> this great. is right. So, yeah. Um, so, but these are these are sort of like the um, these are sort of the highlights that you could pick out out of literally thousands and uh, in fact hundreds of thousands of documents. So we've located and made pictures of or downloaded three hundred thousand documents or so fo so far. Most of it just reams of paper, numbers, hour by hour. Uh, me thinks this is amazing. Yes, me thinks so too. <laughs> all right. <laughs> well, so I could listen all day to the Tide Gauge Observer's version of The Young and the Restless. But getting back to the science, how do they get the data they actually need for the research? So they allow you to look at these records by hand. And so what I've done is I generally get a tripod and a camera and I set it up on the table. And I have an automatic 
clicker or uh, automatic shutter release, and I just flip the page, take a picture, flip the page, take a picture, and uh, do that as fast as possible because there's just limited time in an archive, right? That we have to fly to Washington D.C. or somewhere else, and there's only eight hours in the workday, so I don't even really look or try to analyze the records while I'm doing it. It's more like get in and get out. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways it has a, some analogies with field work that I've done in the past where you go out on a boat and you have an instrument and you try to get, you throw it overboard and you try to get as many profiles as possible. And then once you go back, then you try to load up the data or make it useful uh, for, for science. And it's basically the same process. We go in, we get the data, we then take it home, and we've had an army of students, n literally many, many, many different students have, including high school students in the summer, have contributed to entering these data into Excel sheets. I'm having flashbacks. Uh, turns out I'm having a lot of flashbacks. To, uh, to undergrad <laughs> this time. Uh, maybe, maybe you're in the 70s. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't alive in the 70s. But flashbacks to uh, when I was part of my own uh, army of undergraduates. But, um, but I want to know, once they get the data, like what are they doing with it? What are they actually finding out? So this is where it gets really cool. They actually can tell how much sea levels are changing and tides are changing in specific areas like Boston Harbor. So the USS Constitution is moored in the dry dock that was built in the 1820s. And in order to figure out how high to build it so that it wouldn't flood and how deep to build it, they made tide measurements. Mm. And so their reference to that dry dock, and so we know that the dry dock was built 15 feet above a datum uh, that's now known as the Boston base, and it was propagated forward in time. And so we can therefore connect using a combination of this sort of sleuthing, historical sleuthing, and looking at the papers, the original letters and papers of these engineers and scientists, we can figure out datum or, or surfaces or, or benchmarks that still exist today. And through that, we're able to get a really long record of sea level. And not surprisingly, it shows that indeed there is sea level rise. And in Boston, it's about a foot. Um, but what matters is the, that it's a, it's a verification of the, the record in New York, uh, which was previously the longest record that we have. We're also able to look at where they differ in the small details and try to understand why. Hopefully what that does is it gives us a better long-term view of what sea level rise has been and also what are the, some of the local factors that uh, are important, such as uh, the vertical land motion and uh, you know things like that because it, yeah in the end it's it's the individual communities that are going to be feeling the effects of the climate change and therefore you know we want the more records you have the better one of the things that for example if you've gone to a harbor recently you would see that or to a river the ships are huge now in order to allow these big ships to go into our harbors the harbors themselves have been deepened sometimes by a factor of two or three or even four. And so we've really changed the geometry of our coastal systems. And these tide records allow us to sometimes show that there's been a huge change as a result in how the water flows into and out of these harbors, and therefore in things like the tides. Uh, it used to be a storm surge would come to the coast and then damp out, totally decay. You know, just the energy would be lost in the wetlands or in the shallow waters. But if you make something deep, there's nothing to impede it. And in effect, we've invited the sea in in some cases. And so we have some, we've been able to use the historic measurements and some modeling to show that in the, the Cape Fear estuary in Wilmington, North Carolina, that you have seen a probably a large increase in the worst case scenario for a storm surge. My motivation is not just to be into these old records, but fun, that's really fun, right? <laughs> to, to sort of dive into this other time where there were more gentlemanly scientists and it was just different. But at the same time, we live today and you know we have these issues that are coming down the pike in the next 20, 30, 40 years. And to the extent that 
these trends like to the extent that the past is preview or can help us understand trends and why they are happening and help us better predict what things will look like. That's what motivates me. Well, I say, madame, you did me a grave injustice today by not inviting me to lunch with you and your esteemed colleagues. Methinks you are mistaken, sir. (laughs) You were invited. (laughs) We did extend an invitation to you. Actually, I think you extended the invitation to yourself. Oh, I totally invited myself. No. (laughs) You're totally right. All right, folks. Well, that's all from Third Pod from the Sun. Thanks, Nancy, for bringing us this story and for Stefan for sharing his work with us. This podcast is also produced with help from Josh Spizer, Olivia Ambrosio, Caitlin Camacho, and Lauren LaPuma. And thanks to Kayla Suri for producing this episode. Uh, the AG would love to hear your thoughts. So please rate and review this podcast. Uh, we really appreciate it. It really helps people find out uh, what we're doing and who we are. And you can find new episodes on your favorite podcasting app or at thirdpodfromthesun.com. And that's a wrap. All right. That's all. Thanks, folks. And we'll see you next time. Bye.